Hey, good morning. My name is Joseph McMurray, and as always, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to share with you in uh, this series that we are wrapping up. Well, we'll wrap up next week, but walking through the book of James together. Today, we're going to take a look at James chapter 4. And as we get ready to jump into James chapter 4, I want you to think of what we'll read today really as just a really good reminder Reminders are one of the things that I enjoy the most about my phone. I'm embarrassed to tell you all of the things that I have done or really things that I have forgotten to do because I didn't have a reminder. Before my wife, Lisa, and I were married, actually before we were even dating, I had one such experience that has caused me a tremendous amount of embarrassment both then and every time I've told the story since. And, and like many of my embarrassing stories, this one begins with the phrase, see, there was this girl. There was this girl, and, and we were friends, and honestly, we were just friends. We, we played tennis together, and at one point in history, we were playing tennis together a lot because she was really good. I was never really all that good at tennis, but at one point in my life, I was relatively athletic. So to play tennis with a young lady who could beat me sometimes was pretty fun. She was a really nice girl, and we met at church, and I enjoyed being around her. And so when she asked me to pick her up from the airport on the Monday night of Labor Day weekend, I agreed. I'm sure that she gave me the, the flight information details uh, and, and told me what time I was supposed to be at Charlotte Douglas International Airport to pick her up on the Monday night of Labor Day weekend. And I'm sure that I had all of that in my head, but what I didn't have was a reminder. And on the day of the Monday of Labor Day weekend, a group of friends of mine from our church were gathering together for a cookout at our pastor's house, and all of my friends were there. Lisa was there, and remember, Lisa and I were not yet dating at this time, and, and I was trying to play it cool, like I wasn't really interested in Lisa. I wasn't looking for anything at that time, but I wanted to be hanging out wherever Lisa was hanging out, and 
I had a good time that day. I enjoyed spending time with my friends on the Monday of Labor Day weekend. And as Mondays do, the Monday of Labor Day weekend turned into the Monday night of Labor Day weekend, and I was still there at my pastor's house hanging out with probably 30 friends from my church having a great time. And this was long ago enough that I had a cell phone, but I didn't always carry my cell phone with me. My cell phone was for work, and this was the Monday night of Labor Day weekend, and the last place that I wanted to hear from on a holiday was work. Someone else at the party, though, did have their cell phone, and when it rang, the young lady whose phone it was looked at me and said, um, you were supposed to pick up, we'll just say Cindy, at the airport? Ah. Immediately, I got that feeling that I get every time I forget to do something important. I knew that I had totally forgotten to pick up this poor young lady at the airport. She had depended on me, and I had totally let her down. So I asked the girl who answered the phone if there's any chance maybe Cindy wasn't there yet. Maybe her flight had been delayed and I wasn't a complete idiot for forgetting to pick her up. To which she replied, no, she's been waiting there for an hour and a half. Ugh. I did go pick her up and I apologized profusely. (laughs) Cindy didn't say anything. To me ever again. (laughs) We never played tennis again. We never spoke again, ever. I needed a reminder. We all need reminders, don't we? Our alarm clocks are reminders that that tell us it's time to get out of bed. Our our students, our our parents are reminders that we need to finish our homework and, and do the things they've asked us to do. We receive text messages and emails as reminders of events that are about to take place or of appointments with our doctors or our accountants or whomever. We need reminders. And the same is true with the gospel. What we'll read today in James chapter 4 is a reminder to believers in Jesus of the words that Jesus himself spoke not long before he was crucified. These words were recorded by John in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. What we find in James chapter 4 is that the the early followers of Jesus also needed reminders. They needed to be reminded that the, the grace that has been demonstrated to us becomes the grace that is demonstrated by us. Now, if you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to remember that phrase. The grace that has been demonstrated to us becomes the grace demonstrated by us. Let's read together James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And James, as you have heard some of our other teachers share, this, this letter to the, the churches scattered throughout the known world at the time was written by James, the brother of Jesus. And again, uh, we, we can rely on the words that were written by James. He was an eyewitness to the life of of Jesus himself, and he writes to instruct the church, they call it the the diaspora, those who were dispersed after Pentecost. And, And so James writes to all of those believers in churches throughout the known world at the time, again, ancient world, he says this in James chapter four, beginning in verse one, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, 
you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What James is talking about in these first few verses of James chapter 4 is really just the, the struggles of worldly desires, the struggles uh, of, of um, wanting what everybody else has and, and depending upon what we have and, and um, the, the, um, the world around us rather than on God's provision. He addresses conflicts and, and quarrels that arise among the church. And, and we, can, we can apply James's teaching to our own quarrels and conflicts, both, both here in our church, but also in the church at large. And you can apply this to your relationships with the people in your homes and, and the people that you work with, relational conflict altogether. We can apply this teaching to those conflicts. James attributes the the disputes that we have to the desires that wage war within us. He's highlighting the inherent human tendency to prioritize our own selfish desires over God's will. If we were to stop and and think about it for a moment, I bet all of us could admit that pretty often we put our own desires, our own wants above what God wants what God's purposes are for us and for the church and for our relationships with each other. We're reminded that when we focus on satisfying our own worldly cravings, when when we're focused on satisfying our own selfish ambition, then we inadvertently distance ourselves from God. When our focus is all on us, it begins to feel like God is far away from us. And, And we see this in our relationships with each other. In our relationships with our spouses, with our, with our children, even children, with our parents, when, when our priorities are all about me, 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 and what I want and what I want to do and what I want to have, and we're not getting all of those things that we want, then it feels like those other people in our relationships are moving farther away from us. Because our focus is all on us, me, my, mine, the more we prioritize our own selfish desires, the greater the distance is between us and the people in our lives. And we see the exact same thing played out in our relationship with God as well. The more we focus on ourselves and what we want and what we feel and what we think is right, the farther we feel from God. Let's read on. James chapter 4 and verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. In these verses, James continues this reminder by by warning against becoming friends with the world. Now, I don't want you to think about becoming friends with the world in the way that we think of making friends, like somebody that we hang out with. But instead, really what James is talking about is the idea that we might be enamored by the world and, and what the world sees as right and good and true as opposed to what God calls right and good and true. And James cautions that this friendship, this this admiration is enmity, that means hostility toward God. So, So essentially what James is saying is that to believe what the world says, and when I'm talking about the world, when James is talking about the world, we're essentially talking about those things that are contrary to the truth of what God says, That when we are admiring what the world says as opposed to what God says, it reflects a divided loyalty as though we are not really committed to our relationship with God, but instead we are enamored by what the world says is right and true and good. And by succumbing to the allure of worldly values and pleasures, we risk 
forsaking this deep and fulfilling this, this rich and satisfying relationship that we can have with our Creator. Now, don't misunderstand. God's love for us, God's love for you, doesn't change. It is never diminished based upon where our attention is turned. But when we are so much more interested in what the world tells us is right and good and true than what we know to be right and good and true because it's what pleases God, then we find ourselves being distant from God. But look, James gives the reader instructions for finding our way back. Let's read on. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James basically tells us that the, the, way, the way back, when, when we feel separated from God, when we feel separated from uh, even our relationships with each other, the way back is through humility and submission. James presents a, a transformative path forward. Submission to God and humility before him. James pleads with us to, to resist the devil and draw near to God. Resist the devil. I mean, that, this, this sounds like something out of, a, out of a horror movie. Resist the devil and, and draw near to God. But the reality, friends, is there, there is a real and active enemy who wants nothing more than for us to be deceived and fooled into believing that what the world says is right and good and true is better than what God says is right and good and true. And part of that is that my desires, my wants and needs are way more important than anything else. That, that as long as it makes me happy, then it must be good. When the reality is not everything that makes me happy is good for me. And not everything that makes me feel satisfied is drawing me closer to the Lord or bringing glory to God. It might be bringing glory to me. But does it help me accomplish the purpose of my life, which is to love God and love people and demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit to those around me? James presents this transformative path to bring us back to God, which is to resist the devil and draw near to God. And this powerful act of submission metaphorically involves cleansing our hands and purifying our hearts, indicating a thorough transformation of our inner selves and our outer selves. And when we humble ourselves, we acknowledge that we are dependent upon God and we recognize his sovereignty over our lives, that he is that he is not surprised by anything that we have done or will do. And that his love for us is never ending. And that his grace is sufficient. I don't know about you, but I've been in positions where I was wrong and had to apologize. I would be willing to bet you have too. You may remember one of the stories that I have told previously about losing my temper with my children in the back seat of the car. That was, that was an awful day. I was, a, I was a monster to my kids that day. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible memory of mine. Ultimately, I had to apologize to my kids, but before I could apologize, I had to humble myself. I had to admit that I was wrong and ask for forgiveness. It was a growing moment for all of us, mostly for me. But I would like to think that we are closer because I didn't continue in my anger and my frustration. I, I didn't continue in my focus on myself, but instead I, I humbled myself and, and made things right so that we could enjoy our relationship with each other. And look, 
I don't tell those stories to put myself on a pedestal. I tell those stories because I have experienced this firsthand, living out selfishness and, and anger and frustration and letting it get the better of me. But then understanding that in order to restore those relationships, I've got to be humble. I've got to ask for forgiveness. I've got to take a new path. And this is exactly what our Heavenly Father wants for us. When, when, when you're feeling far from Him because you're so enamored by what the world says is good, He wants you to be restored to a healthy relationship with Him. So how can that happen? Well, it's by humbling yourself before Him. Look at this next section of James chapter 4, verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James addresses the danger of, of judging others and, and boasting about our plans. And he emphasizes that we are not the ultimate judges. Only God holds that role. When we, when we criticize and condemn others, we assume a role that, that, that belongs exclusively to him. That's why it's so amazing to me, and I believe it's true, that in this fellowship of believers, your story is safe here. This is, this is something that, that we, um, I don't want to say pride ourselves on because that's not what it's about, but, but we are grateful to be among a community of believers in which your story is safe here. Our sincere hope is that as you share the things that have gone on in your life, as I share the mistakes that I have made as an awful parent and the ways in which I've had to humble myself and apologize and make things right with my own children, that I would not be judged, but that somebody else is going to confirm and nod their head and say, you know what, I've, I've been there too. Or maybe I haven't had the exact same experience that you've had, but, but I can relate. Your story is safe here. James says that we're, we're called to live in harmony with one another, not to judge. It's not our job to judge. That, that position is reserved for God alone. We're called to live in harmony, recognizing our shared humanity and our mutual need for God's grace. See, when, when someone else has that thing going on in their life that is not exactly what any of us would want to have, our position is not one of judgment, but our position as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is one of support and harmony and recognizing that, you know what, I need the grace of God just as much as they. This is a part of that reminder of what Jesus said in John chapter 13. Again, he said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Last section of James chapter 4. Beginning in verse 13, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. In these final verses of James chapter 4, James encourages us to, to approach our plans with humility and awareness of our limited knowledge. Making plans is natural, but it's crucial for us to submit those plans to God's will. And this can, be, this can be a challenge for us, especially those who are um, entrepreneurial or administratively minded. We, we make plans. 
We set things in motion. And all of that is well and good. But what James tells us is that as followers of Christ, we need to submit our plans to the will of God, trusting him for the outcome. You may have heard me talk about the, the, the honor that I've had to lead a couple of teams to serve with a hospital in, in Kenya. And some of the things that I have learned through those trips are, are life lessons that, that I will never forget. And one of these things that has stayed with me since those trips to Kenya is the, the humility with which my friends in Kenya approach even the simplest things like what we're going to do tomorrow or like driving from one place to another. We, we have a tendency, and when I say we, I mean myself, the people that I know, we have a tendency to, to, to maybe speak a rote prayer over a meal because that's just culturally what you do. These friends of mine in Kenya, when they get behind the wheel of an automobile, they pray. And I don't mean they say God is great, God is good, help us get there on time. I mean they pray. They legitimately ask for God's favor and safety as they travel out of necessity because traveling from one place to another for them can literally be dangerous. And not just because there's a bad driver who might bump into them, but there might be uh, someone with a machine gun who stops them and tells them to get out of the car and hand over all of their money. So when they say, we're going to go from uh, this place to that place, Lord willing, they mean Lord willing. It caught me off guard the first time that I heard them use this phrase. Almost, it sounded flippant to me, but I, I came to realize they literally mean Lord willing. They would say, tomorrow we're going to, to serve at this place or that place, Lord willing. Or, or the next day we're going to, to meet with this pastor and his wife, Lord willing. They were humbly submitting their plans before the Lord as to what they would or would not be able to do. Lord willing. And it's not just a, a tradition or, or a, 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 a culture for them. It's an attitude of humility that submits our plans before God, just as James reminds us here in James chapter 4. James reminds us that our lives are, are, are fleeting. Our ultimate purpose should be to seek and fulfill God's purpose for our lives. So what is God's purpose for our lives? Well, certainly that could be a, a, an entire sermon series on its own, but what do I think? What is God's purpose for your life? It has very little to do with your vocation. I'll tell you that much. But it has a lot more to do with loving God and loving people and demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit to those around you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's God's purpose for your life, to love him, to love the people around you and demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. So as we reflect on James chapter 4, we find a profound call to submit to God's will and embrace humility in all aspects of our lives. And for us, it means drawing near to him, allowing God to, to draw us closer to him, allowing his um, transformative power to guide us away from being enamored by what the world says is right and true and good toward a more profound, powerful existence. So may we learn to live in harmony with one another. May we avoid judging and boasting and instead invest our energy into glorifying God with our lives and our relationships. And as we navigate the challenges of this world, let us continually seek to align with his will, to align with loving him and loving people and demonstrating the fruit of the spirit to those around us, knowing that through humble submission, we find true fulfillment and lasting peace. James chapter four is a reminder to believers of old and to us that the grace that has been demonstrated to us becomes the grace that's demonstrated by us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the scripture. 
Thank you for the reminder that you have, you have given us really a simple plan. We make it complex. We, we make it difficult. But really the plan is simple, to love you and to love people and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit to those around us. God, help us to not um, cloud it so much with, with our own um, wants and needs and desires and selfishness, but instead, God, humble us. Help us to submit to you and use us in the world around us for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted. The sweetest of love.
Hey, thanks again so much for joining us this morning here at Next Level Church. If you would, we would love it if you would share this message with someone else who might benefit from it and uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can see our messages each week as, as they uh, come out on Sunday mornings. And if you would support the ministries here at Next Level Church, you can give to our ministry at nextlevelchurch.org and just click on the give button. As we close, I want to read over you one last time as benediction, the words of Jesus from John chapter 13. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in your relationships with each other and your relationship with God, may you humble yourselves and submit to God. And may the grace that has been shown to you become the grace that is demonstrated by you. Have a great week.